All right, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we ask you to turn to Romans, Romans chapter 10. And uh, while you're turning that way, we always desire your prayers as your pastor and for leadership in the preaching, because if you don't have that, uh, it's a pretty stale bread. So we always want to preach from the place the Lord would have us to preach from. Romans chapter 10, beginning in verse 6. Romans chapter 10, uh, beginning in verse 6, the Bible says, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? This is to bring Christ again from the dead. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith that we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. There is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich upon unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him, him and whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him, in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them which uh, the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and preach glad tidings of good things. Dear Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we give you great glory and honor as you sat on your throne this morning. Lord, we uh, pray that you'd spend your agent among us this morning, the Holy Ghost, and that you'd make your words real to us, Lord, that you'd uh, fire us up, that we, might, uh, that we might be fit for service for you, Lord God, that uh, we would rejoice in our salvation and rejoice in the fact that you've placed us in one of your wonderful churches uh, this morning. Oh God, we pray. Uh, for each and every one of us that are here, Lord, that you would reveal unto us yourself in a great and mighty way. Lord, to the saved, that you'd re re render your, uh, your will to their life, Lord, and for the lost that meet among us, Lord, manifest yourself to them. Lord, take their sin away according to your riches and mercy. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I'll be preaching this morning on some uh, real good things and we'll get to that in a minute and you know in our salvation is so many good things and so many rich things and so many wonderful things just the fact that we're saved you could never begin to describe in this life you could never praise him enough for what we have in prayer with what we have to praise him for now I would say this, most people never comprehend the glory of their salvation because a lot of times they think they're part of it. But I really believe this, if you, uh, if Lord God ever reveals to you his goodness in salvation, you won't have to beg people to church anymore because they appreciate what you've done. Uh, you know what? You, you, you won't have... Uh, uh, to look back on a people that looks like they're mad at everybody because you'll be glad in the things of God. You know what? I have a real issue with people that come to church and look miserable. Yeah. I really do. And that, that may seem crash and that may seem, that's, uh, may seem a little hard. But you know what? That's the way it is. You know what? I love to be with God's people. I love enjoying the company of God's people. I love to be in His house. I love to hear preaching. I love to preach. I love to hear the teaching of the Word of God. And if you don't, you know what? You may have a big issue. Yeah. It, it may be something with you. And, and so we find then as the Lord's people that we need to focus on the good things that God has done for us. Now, we'll go back in our text, and I want to review each one of these verses, 
And again, uh, this is Paul's letter to the church at Rome. And I do believe the Roman church was the one that defected. They became the Catholic church. Uh, Satan came in and took over and changed the very embodiment of Christ into something that's not. And uh, even today, they still all have all the trademarks that is given in Romans chapter 1. See, Paul had some real concerns about this church. And he, he, he maps them out in Romans 1. And, and, and so we find then that to this church, which Paul had some real concerns with, he begins in verse 6, but righteousness, uh, but, but the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. So there's, a, there's two kinds of righteousness, and one is a righteousness that you work up in the flesh, and on the other, the one that you should desire, is the righteousness that comes of God. And so you know what the Catholics are still doing today? They're depending on that righteous self. They're st still depending on a righteous Pope. And, and they never really caught on to the idea that, that righteousness, true righteousness, comes from God. And they had a false type, and I believe Paul knew that. But the righteousness which is faith speaketh on this wise. This is how it comes. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? Now, uh, a lot of times, uh, and again, I, I believe this is Catholicism at its worst. They think the Pope, the Pope is their mediator. Mm -hmm. Sure uh, they think he ascends and, and, and inter, intervenes on their behalf. And you know what? That's a job that belongs unto Christ. He's our mediator. That's what Hebrews says, is it not? He, he's the one that goes on our behalf. And, and so we ought to be glad to have the very Son of the living God as our mediator and not some man that's come up with uh, the idea. So, uh, so he begins... Uh, Say, don't you worry about who is ascending to heaven. That is to bring Christ, uh, that is to bring, uh, who, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. So I want you to see these people that think they, they can bring Christ back unto earth. What they're really doing is taking him out of his office and out of his place at the right hand of God and making him nothing more than me and you. Uh, that, that's Catholicism at its worst, isn't it? And, and so we see, he says, don't you, don't you get in your mind that this is how it does. Now notice what he says in uh, verse 7. Same thing. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ again from the dead. In other words, don't redo the sacrifice. Don't do it. You know, uh, the, the Catholics believe this thing called transubstitution. In other words, when they eat the bread and drink the wine, that is literally the blood of Christ and the body of Christ. See, they're bringing him to an open of shame every time they meet. Right? He says, don't do that. That's not, that's not the means of righteousness. That's not the means to be good with God. That's not the means to be saved. Don't do that. And apparently, they already had some ideas about it even in the first century because he warned them about it. He, uh, he said, don't get involved in this, verse 8. But what saith it? What does it say? What is the way? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, and that is the word of faith which we preach. So we find that it doesn't come through any of these crazy ideas that we're going to send up or that we're going to bring Christ down or any of that foolishness. It becomes a faith. Now, how is your faith really? Now, uh, First of all, you need to ask yourself who you place in your faith in. Is it yourself? Is it some kind of little foolish prayer you pray? Are you, you know, you know what? Even today, my entirety of my ministry and the very soul that dwells within me, I place it entirely on Christ. That's where my faith is at. That, that, that's where it belongs. Nothing good have I done. 
But I want you to see that your faith should be placed on Christ. And Paul makes it very clear. Notice verse 9. And good sovereign grace or, uh, grace or sometime are uh, uh, afraid to preach this. But notice what it says. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shalt believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, just because we believe that God is sovereign in salvation doesn't mean that we can ignore this verse and that we can throw it out with yesterday's trash because you know what? It's in the Bible. And what I'm telling you this morning, if you believe with all your heart that God raised Christ from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Yeah. I still believe that. And you know what? I believe every individual that's saved will confess him and say, Blessed be right. the name right. of the Lord. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't believe in closet Christians, do you? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I was saved back in 1932, but I just didn't tell nobody. I don't believe a word of it. Mm -hmm. I really don't. Because uh, if you know him, you'll confess him. If you know him, you know what? When you're really saved, you want everybody to know what goodness God has showed unto you. And, and so we see that, that Paul makes it very plain to the church at Rome. It's not about... It's not about trying to bring Christ down to be a person again. It's about faith. Verse 10. For with the heart man believeth. Not, not with your noggin. Not with your cognition. Not with your thoughts. With your heart. Your soul. Your inward man. That, that's, where, that's where spiritual belief begins. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Again, claiming the name of Christ, telling everybody what the Lord's done for you, how he's brought you out, how he's made you new. Confession that the Lord Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. And... Um, <laughs> That's, a, that's evidence of salvation, isn't it? That's evidence that you've been born again and that you know him, that you know him uh, in a very personal and wonderful way. Before, uh, verse 10, for with the heart, not with the mind, not with the noggin, for with the heart man believeth unto the righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto, sal to, unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Now, if, if we're ashamed of Christ, I don't believe we've been converted yet. I don't believe we've been sh uh, uh, saved. If we're ashamed to look like a Christian, if we're ashamed to let the Word of God impact our lives and make us look different and act different and present different than the worst of the world, listen, I make my calling and election sure this morning that I really have what I think I have because, of course, if I understand this right, it will impact your life. Yeah. It will. And, and maybe if it hasn't, you don't have what you thought you did because it will make a difference. It will make a difference in your life. Verse 12. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. So no... no uh, uh, no national preferences. Everybody's the same. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, how then shall they call on him whom they have not believed? Now, uh, how shall they, you know, uh, you can't say, Lord, help me, if you don't believe there's a Lord there, can you? Yeah, you know, uh, what, what always and never ceases to amaze me is these, uh, when these atheistic type people or they think God is out there somewhere and not really involved in their lives. Listen, when the doctor says cancer and there's no hope, all of a sudden they're calling upon someone that said they didn't even believe in. You see what I'm saying? I, I don't take much for that. I really don't. Emergent salvation doesn't mean much to me. Because listen, if the only thing you got is a fear of dying, then do you really love the Lord? 
do you really love the Lord? And, and, and so we find here that as Paul is writing to the church there at Rome, he begins to be very specific and says, how shall they call on whom, him and who they have not believed? And shall, how shall they believe on in him of whom they have not heard? And shall they, how shall they hear without a preacher? Now, I want you to see, this is why we're missionary Baptists. We're not, we're not primitive Baptists. We're not some of those distinct like the, the Mennonites and the Amish. Well, if they come, they come. And, but we, uh, we want to send out some preachers, don't we? Listen, I hope we don't ever give up on the idea of missions and that the Lord God is still saving people and that he's still involved in the ministry of saving people. And we, uh, and we support that entirely as a people of God. Once we do that, we become hardship. Once we, once we give that up, we become primitive Baptist people. And, and, and so we find, we find here that, that Paul begs the question, how can they hear without a preacher? Now, I want you to see, it says, how can they hear without a preacher? Uh, they don't say, how can they hear without the weekend experience? I, I was thumbing through Facebook the other day, won't say their name, but a group meets over at Clarksville was having the weekend experience. You know what? I don't want a weekend experience. I want to hear from God. And the Bible says this, it's through the foolish. You know what? People think we're stupid. Because we don't have a big flowery building and, and we don't have laser light shows and all the goofiness that goes with that. But you know why we don't? The Bible says it's through the foolishness of preaching. Preaching the word of God is how individuals are saved. Not, not the youth ministry. You know what? You can take a bunch of youth out and you can drag them downstairs and, and show them a little picture of hell or some kind of little goofy song and, and, and get them to say about anything that you want to. But that does not make them saved. So what we're going to do, we'll stick with the preaching, right? We'll, we'll stick with the plan of God. And it may not be popular, but listen, the fruits are foolproof. So he says, we need some preaching. Then verse 15. And how shall they preach except they be sent? That's your church authority. <laughs> As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. Now, I want you to see it says, how beautiful are the feet. Now, I'm not going to show you my feet this morning because on a physical consultation, they are not beautiful feet. They're kind of weird feet. When you see them, they don't look like everybody else's. But see what it's saying. Uh, back in that day, you know, about the only mode of transportation was this and this. And this is how you got from one place to the next. And so what it was saying is how beautiful is there of them going and getting out there and moving about and spreading the gospel. How beautiful is that? You know what? If we get a young man to go out into the mission field, it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. And that's exactly what he's saying. How beautiful. How wonderful. Because you know what? With that, someone that's never heard the true gospel is going to hear it. They're going to, they're going to hear it. And the Lord God... Uh, could use it for his own glory and his own honor. And so we should always, uh, always be excited about that. Now he says, finally, the end of verse 5, and bring glad tidings of good things. So they're going to preach the gospel, and they're going to tell you about some good things. They're going to tell you about some wonderful things. And this morning, I always want to preach unto you the gospel, and I'll point you unto you, Christ, the only way of salvation. But what we're really going to look at this morning is the good things to come. You know what? I'm not fearful of death this morning because there's some good, good things coming. I'm not fearful of the election in 2020 because there's some good things coming either way that it goes. You know what? There's some good, good things in store for those who love it. Have you ever, have you ever thought, 
as we're uh, listen, we're, we're going in quick. The, the economy in this country is changing very, very rapidly. And uh, they're going to get it away from these little cards. This, this will be worthless. Mm -hmm. And uh, these little cards right here in my, motor, in my wallet will go for about two years. I, and I want to show you this if I can find it. Here's my passport. Notice what's right in the middle. Now that's not just the United States. That is literally all over the world. There's one little number and one little microchip right there. That's my passport. I'm going anywhere in the country with this. Anywhere in the world. And that's how they know who Larry Lafferty is. You know, uh, that's not a good thing. <laughs> but there's some good things that come with it. Because one day I'll say, no, it's not going from my passport here. I refuse. I, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> but isn't it a good thing to see this stuff come to pass? Listen, things that I've heard about since I was that high. Right. Coming to pass in my 50 plus yeah. years, yeah. actually seeing it and understanding what the mark was all these years about a 666. And I, I'm still not uh, completely sure what that number meant, but I do, I do know this. It's going to be for identification. It's going to say who Larry is and how much money he has and how much he's, money he has not and has he complied with the government or has he not. Those are the type of things that's going to be contained. And so we find then we see some good, good things coming. might not feel good to the flesh. It might not look good to the flesh. But listen, it's good, good, good because we see that the time is coming very, very near that will be uh, that will be out of here. Gospel of Matthew. I want to show you a good thing. Matthew 16, verse 16. It's probably one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Matthew 16, verse 16. Oh, Simon Peter had a lot of problems down the road, but notice what he says. Matthew 16, 16. And Simon Peter answered and said unto him, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed are thou, Simon of Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. What a good, good thing this morning if you know the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've been, if you've been introduced to the Master, if He saved your soul, what a wonderful, wonderful thing. You know what? You won't stress about the end days. You won't worry about who's going to win in November. You're not going to worry about the economy as it crashes around us because you know what? It all don't matter anyway because He's the Christ. See, it was to the point, hey, you know what? And it took a little while for Peter to grow in that. You know, that's why the Bible says grow in grace. Because there's a lot of times he says, I don't mean nothing, man. Right? But when he, and, and, and this is historical, so I can't say it's accurate as the Bible, but they said his only request, request, uh, request on crucifixion was that he would be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to be crucified by the Christ. Right. Yeah. See, that's a big difference, isn't it? <laughs> so, <laughs> if you know him, man, that's a, <laughs> that's a good, good thing. That's a wonderful thing if you understand and know the person of Christ. If you don't, I push you toward him this morning. I point you to him because he is the all in all, the Lord Jesus Christ. First John, the little epistle of First John. Uh, a lot of people uh, have different debates on who wrote this book. I, uh, I, I don't reckon it really matters. I know that it's inspired, and that, that's my thing. I personally believe it was the Apostle John. Uh, first uh, First John chapter one verse one. Uh, the Bible says that which was from the beginning. That's why I think he was in the beginning of Christ's ministry. That which was from the beginning, 
which we, meaning him and others, have heard. So I think he saw the, the beginning of the Lord's ministry, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we've looked upon with our own hands and handled the word of life. And in John, the gospel, John 1, 1, he says he introduced Christ as the word. That's why I believe it's one and the same writer. But again, that's not the point. What he was rejoicing about is that he had the word of God. You ever rejoice about that? Just that you have the Bible. You know, that there are people literally that will give up their lives just to have one page of that book, much less the word of God in its entirety. I don't even know how many copies we have. And, and you know, sometimes I think that's the problem is our easy access and the many that we have, we don't appreciate it. Yeah. Over in the, the end of the county on the Cumberland City Inn, there's an old Methodist church down there. Um, it, it was organized in 1796. And for a long time, they had their original Bible sitting in the front of the church, and they had one Bible for the entire church. See, I bet it was precious to them back then, don't you? If you wanted, if you wanted to see it, if you wanted to go in and read it, you had to go down to their little building and get in there and dig in it on your own. And when you and when you left there, I guess you took the thoughts with you and contemplated on the goodness and the wonderfulness of the Lord. And here we are. There's one. There's one. Uh, there's two, there's one, there's two, all around us, copy after copy after copy of the Word of God. Oh, aren't we? Isn't that a wonderful thing? Isn't that a good, good thing that, that, that we can just feast on the entirety of the Word of God? And listen, you treasure it, you get in there, you love it, because you know what this is going to be called? Already is called by many. You know what they're going to call this? It's hate speech. And they'll write in on that ticket and they'll take the word of God away because it says sodomites are sodomites. And it says that that is a desecration of our God. It says, it, it, it says that, it's, uh, that it's a sin that God hates. And so they hate this book. They hate this book. So relish it while you got it. Right. Relish it while you got it. Because listen, uh, it, it's a good Good, good, wonderful thing to have a full copy of the Word of God in our hands and we ought to rejoice in that. The Gospel of John 15. The Gospel of John chapter 15, verse, uh, verse 15. The Gospel of John chapter 15 in verse 15. The Lord Jesus Christ in his final teaching to his apostles before his death, and then he had those 40 days after the resurrection, but this was on the night of the crucifixion. He says this, uh, John 15, 15, Henceforth I call you not servants, for, servant, for the servant not knoweth not uh, what the Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all the things that I've heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. Yeah. Isn't it a wonderful, great blessing tonight, this morning, to be called the friends of God, to be called the friends of Christ? You know, my friends <laughs> know when things are not going right with me. I don't have to. I don't have to say, you know what? I'm really down and out. Uh, Got home yesterday. I talked to Donna a little bit about what was going on with mom, but when I came through the door, she said, Larry, what's wrong? You know why she was able to do that? Because she's my friend. Uh, whenever you, you have an intimate relationship with Christ, it's the very same thing. He knows when not, something's not right. He knows when it's not good. And you know the good thing? Even if Donna has heard it a thousand times, I can tell her again, you know, mom's just not right. Mm -hmm. And she'll listen to me. And she'll say, well, Larry, if you, if you want to move her here, we'll, we'll move her. See, she gives me options. And the best part is she listens. 
You know what? Whatever you may be suffering this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ, he'll listen. You can lay it all out there by him. And he'll, he, he, he'll review the problem with you. You know why? Because he's your friend. Mm -hmm. He's your friend. The Bible says he, uh, that the Lord God is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Right. And so we find then that's another rich, 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 wonderful blessing. Psalm 55. Psalms 55 and verse 22. Psalms uh, 55 and verse 22. The Bible says this, Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee, he shall never, and he shall never suffer, suffer the righteous to be moved. Now, I want you to see here there's a, a threefold blessing in this one. Uh, of all the blessings that he gives us, of all the good things that he has given us, he first of all says, cast thy burden upon the Lord. Now, this morning, I don't know what you're carrying around, but you know what? I do know this. After 25 years of pastoring, I can tell when people are burdened down with something. I can tell when they're troubled. I can tell when things are not right, just like you can look at your children and see that there's a little bit of something off there. Uh, pastoring is the exact same way. And this morning, you know what we need to do? Whatever your trouble is, whatever your situation is, just cast it all on the Lord. You know, uh, tell him that there's not enough money left. Tell him that you don't know where the job's at. Tell him, tell him that uh, your health ain't what it ought to be. Tell him that you're scared that you can't find the job. Get, give him those burdens. You know, you know why I think a lot of people, a lot of believers, a lot of Christians are not happy like they ought to be. They don't cast the burdens on the Lord. And if they do, they run back and they pick them back up and, yeah, and they run home with them. Yeah. There you go. And so, in the very same way, we just need to cast them and leave them there. Let, let, let him be sufficient. He is, oh, he's so sufficient to take care of the problems. Cast him on them. Leave them there. Don't be troubled. Don't be upset because our God is completely able to take care of all the problems that exists, all the problems that are present. Now notice the next thing. And he shall sustain thee. You know, a lot of free will I grew up, the, the biggest church back home in Carlisle when I grew up and they had the ritzy fancy building uh, was the free will church there on the corner as you turn to go to Cumberland City. And uh, uh, <laughs> they's always talk about holding out. <laughs> Which I'm to say about free wills and holding out, at least they're consistent in their thought, right? If they can come to Christ, they ought to be able to lead him, right? So it's consistent thought. <laughs> Not that it's right, but at least, at, least, at least it's consistent. So those people obviously did not embrace this wonderful teaching in 55 verse 20. It says, and he shall sustain thee. You know what? I don't have to worry about myself because he's going to sustain me. When I make mistakes, and I frequently do, I don't have to be troubled about it because he shall sustain me. When I get old and demented and I'm talking out of my head and saying horrible things, that with my cognition, I never would. You know what? He's going to sustain me even then. I, I, I'm not worried. I'm not worried about going to hell. Not because I'm so good, but because he's going to sustain me. It's going to, it, it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful time. He's so, so good to us. And so much of the time we ignore his goodness to us. Then the last part says, he's going to sustain us, and then he says, and he shall never suffer the righteousness, the, excuse me, the righteous to be moved. Now, that's a, that, you talk about a verse for, for perpetuity of the saints. There you go. He says the righteous, the redeemed, they're not going to be moved. You know, uh, 
One time Adam said this, and it, it blessed my heart. I know it's about, I think it was teaching downstairs. It's been some time ago. And he said this. He said, you know what? There never was a question on Sunday morning about if we're going to church today. But he said, Mom and Dad got up and they started getting things together, get Anna together, get Joey together, and the rest of us knew it was church day because we, you know what? Uh, that comes from God. He's, he, he's the one that keeps you going. He sustains. You know what? If, he, if, if you don't have some kind of consistency in your walk with the Lord, are you really walking with him or not? Because he said, he won't let the righteous be moved. And you know what? As he reveals truth to you down through the ages, and listen, good, good man that I am just blown away with, Jeff Short. He's on that ESB version now. And again and again, you hear, uh, you hear more and more people going in that direction, giving up that book in your life. You know why I stick with it? And listen, I have just as much or more education than they do. I have a four-year degree in science, and that book is still precious to me. And it's not bragging on me because the Lord has brought me through it. Mm -hmm. See, I don't have to worry about any of that, do I? Because it's all of the Lord. It, it, it's all of God. I don't worry about holding out faithful because I'm being sustained and I'm being and I'm being not moved. Ever thought about where you're gonna be in 20 years? I think about a local church, and we we'll use that loosely. I'm not to say where they are, who they are. It's unimportant, really. But they started out as a holiness Pentecostal church in the 40s. And now you would not believe. You just would not believe. Now, I don't defend their doctrine. I know how foolish a lot of that junk is. But the only thing I can come to this, they weren't sustained. So maybe it was never, the promise was never applicable to them because they didn't believe the truth, not really. So people who stop believing the truth will not be sustained. The only other Baptist church in town, and you very loosely call it that, up on the hill at First Baptist, do they have any remnant of Baptist truth left? I mean, really, do they preach only Christ? That puts Christ and Christ alone, that you can't come to him, he has to come to you. Did they preach Baptist doctrine? I would guess not. But you know what? We're being sustained, are we not? We, we, we're, we're sticking to the same stuff we believed 20 years ago, are we not? Yeah. That, that, that sustaining, it don't come from us, it comes from God. And so he's made that wonderful promise that I will sustain thee. And that's one of the promises that he gives to his people. Now, go with me to 1 John again, this time chapter 3. Uh, back to 1 John chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to read a single verse. You all know it well. 1 John 3, 9. Whosoever is born of God doeth not commit sin, for his, meaning Christ, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now you talk about a salvation verse, one that says it's all about Christ and none about you, the one that says that I don't sin in the spirit anymore. There it is, it's laid out before you, and whoo, what a rich and rich and rich and wonderful verse that his salvation is forever and ever and ever and ever. Yeah. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. Uh, you, talk about, you talk about a blessing. Mm -hmm. About something you lay down on your head on your pillow tonight, and if it comes a tornado and takes the house away, you sleep like a baby. Because you know what? It, it, doesn't, it doesn't really matter, does it? So, do you possess that kind of relationship with Christ? And if you do, what a wonderful, wonderful blessing. Now, the last place I'm going to read this morning in 1 Thessalonians. Familiar verses of Scripture, but I want to hear it. I want to read it in your reading. 
very frequently I read this at graveside because it's a rich blessing to those that are redeemed. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, the Bible says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with shout. And so uh, get the picture in your mind this morning, the Lord Jesus Christ coming down. And I point out it doesn't say that he makes touch. <laughs> He just, he just hovers around for a minute. He says he'll come down and descend with a shout. Here I come. Come up hither. I'm here. I don't know what he'll say. But he'll say something. He says he'll come with a shout. The voice of the archangel. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Amen. Now, this is, this is what I, I don't believe in soul sleep. I don't believe David's out there taking a nap. Uh, that's his body. That's what he used for 65, almost 65 years. That's all that's there. Because the Bible says, <laughs> uh, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And if you remember when the rich man died, he says immediately, immediately, he was in fire. It didn't, it didn't take 20 years like that. So this resurrection then that he promises has to be of this because see, this thing is not fit to serve God in any way whatsoever. You know what? Me and Brother Jimmy was talking. My knees really hurt sometimes. And you know what? It's a pair of 52-year-old knees. And they're getting wore out. And they're getting difficult to use. And you know what? If this body was perfect, I'd still be running like a teenager down through there, right? This right here that's getting gray, and this right here that's getting gray, you know what? It'd be just as black as the rest of it, but it's not. You know why? Because his flesh is giving way. Yeah. And, and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, that, <laughs> that we ought to be able to praise him for what's ahead. So the dead in Christ. If David's saved, he'll come up out of that little place over there, and he'll come out to meet the Lord in the air. <laughs> Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with, the, with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. You talk about some comfort, I'll give it to you. If you're saved, it's as good as done. <laughs> you know what? I don't, I don't know what's coming up in the next little bit. But if you're saved, I can say this everything's going to be all right. <laughs> If you're saved, it don't matter who's president, don't matter who's vice president, it don't matter what currency is, don't matter if we run out of nickels, right? Because he's on the throne. In the very worst case scenario, you starve to death. And then you know what? You're home with the Lord. <laughs> so what, right? And I'm making a good long time, right? And I'm home with the Lord Jesus Christ. Throughout the seasons, ages, evermore with Him. What could be better? That's some good things this morning. That's some precious truths that we ought to cling to, we ought to desire, and that we ought to be able to feast on in hard times, in difficult situations. Remember, hey, He's still on the throne. <laughs> He's doing all things for our good. <laughs> you know, I think sometimes we forget that verse. It says, all things work together. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. All things work together for good to them that just love the Lord and, tem and to them that are called according to His purpose. Not our purpose, but His purpose. You know, when I've heard that verse... <laughs> Uh, quote it. Most people quote it this way. All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. But don't say the rest of it. Unto them that are called according to his purpose. And they leave that portion out, don't, don't they? Uh, you know why? I don't think they like to call it. So this morning I ask you, uh, can you rejoice in him this morning? Can you rejoice in the person of Christ, these good, good things that will sustain us on some dark and dreary days.